Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar called How to Start and Run an E-Commerce Business. A big welcome to Tufts students, alumni, and members of the Tufts community. And if you're not a jumbo, we're still glad that you're here. This event is brought to you by Tufts Entrepreneurial Network, or TEN, in conjunction with the Office of Alumni Relations and the Tufts Entrepreneurship Center. For those of you not familiar with TEN, the Tufts Entrepreneurial Network is committed to bringing together Tufts alumni across all business, professional, and education sectors to discuss challenges and opportunities related to entrepreneurship. You can find out more about any upcoming events or watch any webinars you may have in the link that's gonna be posted in the chat window. And thank you to the Tufts team who produces these events, especially Amy McDonald, who is turning the dials behind the scene on today's webinar and all webinar. My name is Muggs Buckley. I am the Vice President of Marketing at Cherish, Cherish.com. Hello from San Francisco, where Cherish is based, and I am coming to you from. I'm a proud jumbo, class of 19, hard to say this, 85. That's 35 years since I graduated from Tufts. And if you're not familiar with Cherish, we're an online marketplace for chic and unique home furnishings with more than 515,000 highly curated items for sale. We were founded in 2013, and two weeks ago, we announced our Series B funding of $33 million. As VP of Marketing, I oversee our press, partnerships, social media, content marketing, trade relations, and SEO marketing efforts. I'm really pleased with the panelists we have today. They are superstars in their field and they are killing it. They may not be saying that, but I'll say it proudly, they are killing it. Uh, first up is Rachel Blumenthal, class of 02. She is founder and CEO of Rockets of Awesome. Rachel is New York based. She's an entrepreneur, a mom, and she created Rockets of Awesome in 2016 to offer parents a simpler and smarter way to shop for high quality kids. Hey, Rachel, thanks for joining us today. And also on the, on the line is Leah Winograd. She is class of 2012, co-founder and COO of Pepper. In 2017, Leah co-founded Pepper, a direct-to-consumer bra company for women who wear small cup sizes. In 2019, Pepper grew an impressive 800%. Hello, Leah, welcome. And for in terms of our agenda today, I'm gonna ask Leah, and Rachel to introduce themselves, bring us up to speed with uh, what they've been up to since graduating from Tufts. We're gonna go 30 minutes into questions and I'm gonna rifle through as many questions as I can. And at the bottom of the hour, we're gonna be joined by another jumbo, Josh Goldman, class of 88. He is a veteran venture, venture capitalist, an angel investor. He is a general partner of Catapult Ventures. And he will be in our, our Q&A session. So if you have a question, he's gonna be compiling all the questions and he may be able to field a question as well. So Rachel and Leah, if you can unmute. Uh, first up, Leah, I'm gonna ask you to bring everybody up to speed, say hello. Tell us a little bit about your journey from Tufts and a little bit about Pepper. Yeah, hi everyone, super excited to be here. Um, I haven't been on any events uh, or you know, in touch with a lot of Tufts people since I graduated, so this is exciting to be um, back with the community again. Um, so I graduated from Tufts in 2012 and I got an offer from McKinsey uh, right out of um, uh, college and they called me and they said, you know, you can either start your uh, business analyst role in July or you can start it in December. I, they gave me that option and I took the option to start in December and then I had six months to um, do something different while having this offer um, to, to join an amazing firm afterwards. So I ended up um, flying to Brazil without, you know, I didn't know anyone there, but moved there, wanted to learn Portuguese. And then I ended up joining a startup accelerator and that's how I became acquainted with startups and really fell in love with that world. Um, then in January, ended up going to McKinsey. I was there for two and a half years and had um, an incredible journey. I was a business analyst and learned um, all sorts of you know, analytical communication skills and was working with um, some of the biggest clients um, in Latin America in a number of different industries. Um, but I always had this passion for startups um, because of the experience that I'd had right out of college. So I, 
knew that um, and ended up quitting McKinsey and then flying to New York and started interviewing with different startups. Um, and then I joined a technology startup in New York called Converse Social. Um, it is a um, tech platform that aggregates conversations going on on social media and filters the ones that um, are worth to answer from a customer service perspective. So I was learning about an entire different kind of world and it was really exciting. Um, and then I started thinking about my next step. So I was um, applying to MBA programs while simultaneously trying to start my own company, Pepper. And um, so Pepper is a bra company and we make bras that finally fit women who wear small cup sizes, double A, A and B cups. And we launched Pepper on Kickstarter in 2017 and um, it was really successful and we funded it 470% above the goal. And right when Kickstarter happened, I also got accepted into my full-time MBA program at NYU Stern. So I did both my MBA and my startup for two years and I graduated last year and I've been doing Pepper full-time soon. Is that it? Just kidding. Okay. <laughs> That's a lot going on, Leah. Terrific. Uh, Rachel, how about you? You're a three-peat entrepreneur. Tell us, <laughs> bring everybody up to speed in the next minute or so about what you've been up to since Tufts. Yeah, well, I was a economics and political science double major um, because I was desperate for an entrepreneurship major and it just um, was sort of testing into when I was a senior. So um, like every economics major, I applied to banking jobs and got one. And then I think it was April or May, my senior year, I panicked and realized I had no idea what kind of job I had just gotten at Morgan Stanley. So <laughs> I called them and told them I couldn't accept the job. and. Um, called the company that I internship, uh, interned for and basically begged them to take me and I went to work for them. And so I started uh, my career in New York City in fashion. Um, I was at Yves Saint Laurent in the uh, PR department doing celebrity dressing and working um, with magazines. And um, I really fell into being an entrepreneur. I was um, hand making jewelry on, on the side at night and friends that um, were editors at magazines decided to feature me in, ma in a magazine. And um, the next thing I knew, I was a jewelry designer and I decided to um, figure out what that meant. And so I set up shop in my living room and built a jewelry company. Um, so I built a jewelry company. We we're in about 500 stores worldwide. We did um, a big business in Asia and we did private label for American Eagle, Target, and J. Crew. And I sold that business about, or I licensed it rather, um, about nine years ago. And um, at the time, my husband was, uh, who also went to Tufts, we met when we were freshmen at Tufts. Mm -hmm. um, he was launching a business called Warby Parker. And so I was involved in the early days of Warby um, when he was in business school with him and his co-founders and sort of building the brand and um, going and developing the supply chain and developing the early um, styles that were in the line. And um, I was also launching a new uh, company called Cricket Circle at the time, which was a content platform geared towards um, new parents who were trying to figure out what to buy for their babies. Um, you can kind of think of it like a cliff notes for what to buy when you have a baby. And as I was building that, I um, was really fascinated by the connection we have with the consumer and um, just how uh, much they trusted us and, and the loyal following we had. And um, they were very, very open with sort of how uh, their needs sort of evolved as their babies grew and developed. And um, that business really evolved into Rockets of Awesome, which is a kids apparel brand. Um, kids apparel in the US is a $50 billion market. Um, so it's a very, very big uh, opportunity in the US. The biggest mm. uh, brands are Carter's and Children's Place. And um, I believed that we could build um, sort of a next generation modern kids apparel brand that would really speak to a modern consumer and just make it more fun and easier to be able to deliver really cool stylish kids clothes at an accessible price point. Um, so we sell boys and girls clothes, sizes two to 14, um, really cool stylish kids clothes that you'd probably wanna wear yourself if it came in your size, um, but everything's priced sort of at Old Navy Gap prices. Um, we have a subscription offering, we do e-commerce, we're primarily direct consumer. 
We had a store, a pop-up store in New York City in Flatiron last year, um, and we're supposed to open four more this year. Um, thankfully, we hadn't s mm. assigned any of our um, any of our LOIs when the world ended. So yep. uh, we're laying low right now. Um, but I just, I love building businesses. I love building brands. Um, and I've spent a lot of time um, really dedicating myself to helping young entrepreneurs because when I moved to New York, I didn't know a soul. I had no connections. Um, and I really just sort of like faked it till I made it. And I still feel like I'm faking it. Um, so here I am to just help people fake it and figure it out. Awesome. Well, thank you. Congrats. Uh, Leah, over to you. What's in a name? So you both have interesting brand names. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the importance of, a, of naming your company, how you got to Pepper, and any words of wisdom for anybody starting a company, and, and, if they're, and what to consider when naming your company? Yeah. Um, so I think at the time, you know, we looked at the competitive landscape and we noticed that a lot of the bra companies had names that uh, were associated with, you know, either a hypersexualized kind of meaning or something relating to love. So, you know, there was Victoria's Secret, you know, there was a dormy. And so we wanted to be slightly different. Um, so Pepper, we thought was a really kind of like short and memorable name. Um, and it wasn't taken by anyone. So that was, you know, important to like look up um, to see if anyone else has a trademark on it. Um, and but, you can spell it. <laughs> and you can spell it. Um, <laughs> but it was really um, like a random kind of process. Like we were going through a lot of different names um, with my co-founder. And we were at this um, meeting because we were working full-time jobs at the time and we were eating lunch and we were, and I was like thinking like, oh, you know, what if we named it sugar? And then it was like, oh, it's a little bit too like feminine, whatever. And then there was like a pepper, you know, there was like pepper right next to that. So I said pepper and I was like, no, never mind. And she was like, no, I like love it. Um, so it was really random in terms of how it happened. But then, you know, pepper has a really nice alliteration with petite and, you know, that kind of like aligned well with the brand. The, the ingredient pepper has a lot of flavor. It's punchy. It's not overly spicy. Cool. So it ended up being like a really kind of cute and nice um, name that we both loved and knew that that was it. Rachel, Rockets of Awesome. I think there's a story behind there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Rockets of Awesome is really inspired by kids. And what I love about kids is that they're weird and quirky and they pick their nose and they're gross and like they think nothing of it. Um, and um, I really wanted to sort of like bottle this infectious like joy and confidence and energy that kids have. And I wanted the name to represent that. And so it had to be really bold and confident. Um, and so the name has no sort of space reference whatsoever. It really is representative of the kids. And so we say that the kids are rockets of awesome. Um, but it really was like thousands and thousands of post-it notes of words mm -hmm. that we put up on a board and sort of started to like process of elimination of piecing together until we had something. And then it was so weird and it was really long. And everyone said like, you know, no one's ever going to want to type in that URL and, you know, our Twitter handle like doesn't have the E on the end because it's too long. Um, but we were just like, you know what? We kind of like that it's weird. And, and my belief in building brands is like, you have to be different. And when everyone goes this way, like you have to go that way. And so I liked that a lot of people who like basic things, like didn't like it. Um, to me, that was like a sign that it was the right way to go. And, and so it's, it's, um, it's worked really well for us. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about fundraising and, and kind of where you are in fundraising. Lise, Leah, you had an amazing story about how you got started. Can you share with everybody a little bit of your Kickstarter and if you can share where you are in funding today? And again, as we talk, if you have words of wisdom for those who are about to enter and pitch businesses, if you can, if you can offer some advice. Yeah. Um, so we launched our business on Kickstarter because for us, it was really important to validate whether people actually wanted our product before going out and, you know, raising money for it. So we never really approached it in, in the way of, you know, wanting to get the funding to, to build this. We wanted to build it ourselves. So um, we knew that for, to get to Kickstarter, we needed to invest a little bit, but essentially we, we needed to invest in a minimal viable product, which for apparel just means having samples, you know, having a video, having a Kickstarter page, and then having a plan to launch. 
So we, um, we, we spent $5,000 on the Kickstarter um, and we raised $47,000 on it. Um, and then we sold additional pre-orders on the website and got to $100,000 of the goal. Um, so essentially, um, I'm from Colombia. Uh, and so my co-founder kind of came up with the concept of Pepper. Um, she had a really kind of like personal, you know, story behind that. And she um, felt really passionate about it. And she told me about it. And essentially, my job became to bring the product to life because mm. I had these connections in Colombia. So I flew there, spoke to a bunch of factories, and then we started prototyping um, with a with more like we're not designers, um, so we don't come from that background. But we really understood the pain points that we were trying to solve for. Um, so we would tell the factory, you know, we want to solve for this, and let's like change these aspects about you know the design until we like really nailed what we wanted to um, to launch. And then they we went through like various iterations of those prototypes, and then we with those prototypes we did a photo shoot, and then we did the Kickstarter, and then um, you know we we started we we drafted like a list of you know people we wanted to email um, that were you know who worked at publications, and so we told them our story. We're really like authentic in how we approached it. And we approached them directly. Like we didn't hire a PR firm or anything mm -hmm. like that. And then on the day of Kickstarter, you know, we were featured on Huffington Post, you know, Cosmopolitan, like we had like 15, you know, press hits um, that were, you know, telling people about our story and driving traffic to um, the Kickstarter and creating kind of like the pre-orders. Um, so there was like a lot of momentum that was associated with that. And then after the Kickstarter, um, everyone was rushing us to fundraise and they're like, you know, go and talk to investors now because the momentum's there. Like, you're no, you don't know what's going to happen later. And our approach was a little bit different. We like, we didn't, we wanted to use the funds to make the order. And then we wanted to, um, you know, we knew the concept was resonating with people. And then we mm -hmm. needed to test whether there was a product market fit and whether the product that we had created was going to be loved as much as the brand. Um, so we did that and we waited as much as we possibly could to fundraise. And then we did a $2 million seed earlier this year. Um, but by the time we fundraised, we knew exactly what we wanted to spend it on. And we had done enough testing to know like what our metrics were. Um, so I guess like my advice would be, you know, everyone's going to approach it differently, but that was just how what was important to us was to wait as much as possible because we also have more information about the business and we can like, you know, get a higher valuation when we go on fundraise versus mm -hmm. doing it early on when you don't have those data points. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks. And Rachel, how about you? Any words of wisdom, kind of how long things take and... Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with you that like the, the longer you can sort of hold out and raise the least amount of money as humanly possible in the beginning, um, the better because you're, you're really sort of um, just continuing to increase your, your valuation and um, not um, create dilution for yourself. Um, you know, I, I think that fundraising always takes much, much longer than anyone anticipates it to take. And um, I would say that like, the first 10 people that you have a conversation with, with are usually not the first, like nobody in the first 10 are usually the ones that ever give you money. Um, and so just sort of like setting expectations that it is, it is a long journey. It is one of the most painful things you will ever do. Um, it is like totally soul crushing. And any entrepreneur that tells you otherwise is just flat out lying because like the most accomplished entrepreneur, I mean, maybe Jeff Bezos will tell you others, but I don't think so. Um, like every entrepreneur just, you know, it's like crushing to your soul for you to have this like amazing vision. And like, you just want to like run after it and for people to be like, no. And like every time they say no, it's, it's personal, especially in the beginning when it is about you as an entrepreneur. It's not about even as much your vision and certainly not about an accomplishment yet, right? It's about, do they believe in you? Do they want to be in business with you? And so you really have to like learn how to eat rocks for breakfast and not take it personally and just know that it's sort of like a long path. But if you're persistent and you're committed and you really, really listen, and I think that that's something that I learned along the way is like, listen in every single conversation because you really learn and you get feedback and you have to take every single meeting, um, take the feedback from every meeting to learn how to adjust for the next conversation and learn how to adjust sort of your pitch 
for each future conversation mm -hmm. because it makes you um, better and better. But um, pitching and raising money is sort of like dating. Like you have to play the game and you have to like play it cool. And like, you're like not really available. And um, <laughs> it, it is that game. Um, and it's not fun, but everyone does it and it ultimately works out. It's just, it's challenging through the process. Okay, great advice. I'm gonna keep you here for a second, Rachel. We're gonna to flip to hiring, hiring your like initial team. Um, you've had three businesses, you've hired people along the way. Um, how many, about how many people are you today? And then when you start, I think you had some words of wisdom for like who to hire and skill set. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so we're about 20 today. And, um, you know, your first couple of hires really have to be sort of like Swiss Army knives. Like they have to be people who are equally as passionate about what you're building as you are and as willing to roll up their sleeves and get in there and like unpack boxes and build things and like run errands and literally like do anything. Um, they have to be like really creative. They have to be analytical. Like they, the, like you're asking for the world, right? And you're not going to get everything out of everyone, but like you're looking for the passion, you're looking for the commitment and the loyalty, and you're looking for people who um, are pretty, they're either decently junior or they're people that are willing to take like a massive pay cut because they're so passionate about what you're doing. Um, but they're people that are just you know, really into and excited by the vision and um, what you're building and um, are sort of willing to, they're like a put me in coach, right? And they're willing to sort of like go into different roles depending on the needs of the business. And then, you know, as you start to make progress, that is when, you know, and you'll feel it and, and everyone sort of goes through growing pains. And I think that, I've been one where I sometimes like will wait too long at this point, but you start to get to a point where you do need experts in different areas of the business. But, um, but until that point, you really want the people that can like just do a little bit of everything with you. Yeah, that's to, to that point. I've seen it. I've been around a bunch of startups and I've, I've seen, I've been in companies where we've hired a big name to kind of bring either clout or something. And, uh, Folks like that sometimes have managed businesses before, like managed a PR agency or managed an outside agency, but not necessarily has done the work. So I think your Swiss Army Knife is a is really good one. Yeah, my favorite is when you interview someone and you say, you know, like, so tell me what you think about working at a startup. Because like you look at their resume and they've never worked at a startup and they're like, mm. Well, you know, like I basically, you know, like this team that I worked at at Google, like it's basically like a startup, you know, like we acted and thought like a startup. And I'm like, you have no idea like what a startup is like, you know, and, and you really have to push and like help them understand because it's fundamentally different. And, and you want to make sure that you're like mitigating risk for the company, but also for this person. Right. Leah, um, you are a co-founder. So tell a little bit about how you divide and conquer with your co-founder. You're also a remote, co you, you and your co-founder are remote. And any words of wisdom that you've learned along the way about hiring core team members? Yeah, um, so we are fully remote. Um, and I think this is something that a lot of investors gave us a lot of, you know, uh, we're really hard with us on. And then COVID hit and we were like, ah, this is perfect. <laughs> um, because we didn't have to change anything about how we operated essentially. Um, but I think at the beginning there was a lot more overlap between what my co-founder and I did because the startup was so early. And so essentially like I'm the COO, but there weren't any like real operations to be run. Like actually our roles were kind of switched at the beginning. So my co-founder Jacqueline, she had a warehouse, she's based in Denver. And so we had our own warehouse and she was packing all the boxes at first and doing it herself because she wanted to learn that process. Mm -hmm. And then I was like kind of doing marketing, which is sort of what she was supposed to be doing. And I think now that the startup has grown a lot more, it's becoming more, you know, there's a bigger need to operationalize certain aspects. So um, the way we divided now um, is I manage kind of like the um you know the warehouse that we work with making sure they're keeping up with you know their slas kpis the relationship with the manufacturer and everything um that has to do with product development um and then you know customer service um and anything that has to do with kind of like the experience and then she handles you know press brand um you know influencer marketing 
Um, so now there's a more of a clear divide and now we're starting to like split calls, but you know, before we were both kind of like involved in, in everything. Um, and then in terms of hiring, I think the way we've approached it is similar to Kickstarter. Like we've always kind of been like had a scrappy mindset. So, uh, the way we've been building out our marketing team is through contractors. And then w as we work with them, we learn more about what we need. Um, so one of the things, you know, we've never started another company before. So through the interview process is when we actually learn what we need. So we'll interview a number of people and then based on those conversations, we'll start kind of like, um, you know, nailing, nailing it down a little bit better. And we have grown, you know, for example, like our customer service, our first full-time hire was our customer service manager. Mm -hmm. She started, um, packing boxes at the warehouse and helping Jacqueline out. And then that was a, like on the side. And then she was doing part-time customer service on the side. And now she's full-time customer service. And now she's managing a team of customer service agents. Um, so we have like a high retention. People like love the brand. We really focus on um, hiring people that are passionate about the brand because, you know, that that's, you know, essentially like what we were saying, like that's, that's the way to, that, that's the only way they'll be like happy um, and you know, feel comfortable taking a pay cut or whatever it is. Um, they have to be passionate about what you're doing. Um, and then other things we've, other ways we've approached it is um, we have brought on advisors initially to advise us on like, and we'll do it ourselves. And then when we learn how to do the job, then we'll hire someone because we already know like exactly what we need. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we're a team of, we just hired someone. So we're a team of four full timers and then the rest of us are contractors. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about, now you have your product or your service. Uh, Rachel, can you tell us a little bit about how you entered and how you launched? And then was there an aha moment where you're like, oh my God, this is taking off. And what do you attribute that to? And is there any story behind that? I think you're on mute, Rachel. There you go. Um, I... I believe that you only have one moment to launch. Um, and I'm a big believer in sort of like big, sexy launches um, and sort of like wrangling every last human that you possibly have ever spoken to and met to leverage their networks and, and, and their networks to sort of like tell everybody that this brand is now here. Um, and so um, all of the launches, launches that I've ever done, obviously they've evolved over time given that social media has evolved, but um, we always do a big strategic push around um, both um, traditional media as well as social media influencers um, across sort of like every single platform. Um, in the beginning, um, it hasn't been across sort of like paid performance channels um, because we've never had budget to do that. Um, but we have paid sort of PR agencies to do it. Um, we've never paid, we've never had budget to pay influencers, but um, we have like hustled our tushes around to like build every relationship on the planet with every influencer we could to like send them stuff to then post to ask them to do a favor. Um, and I think that launch day is like the greatest day ever because it's that moment when like your baby is born and like everyone you can imagine who you, you know, like you can think of is talking about your brand. And it's really exciting to see the response and sort of like the ripple effect of that. And um, I think the ripple effect and for us in particular, because um, it's adults that are on social media that are talking about rockets, but really it's kids that are actually using it. Mm -hmm. It's really fun for us to then see like how are kids reacting. And so for us, it was, you know, what was, you know, a couple weeks later, how were the kids reacting? You know, what were their like really authentic reactions to opening the boxes, to wearing the clothes? What were the stories we were hearing from customer service, you know, through customer service or anecdotally from parents of, you know, what the kids were saying about the clothes? And, you know, kids don't lie, you know, like kids don't, aren't nice, right? Just to like be nice. Um, and they were saying the things we wanted them to say. They were saying like, oh my God, it's so soft. It's so stretchy. It's so comfortable. Like it's so fun and so happy. And like, it's the only thing I want to wear. And like, I feel so cool. And the minute we started hearing that like kids were pointing out other kids in the playground saying like, you're wearing Rockets of Awesome. And like, I'm wearing Rockets of Awesome. We felt like, 
All right. There like you we're go. starting to like, it's starting to sort of catch on. And yeah, you know, now we want to see that it, you know, it continues to sort of go like outside of our bubbles, but um, that's when it really starts to feel like it's, it's happening. Awesome. Leah, I'm going to go to you. Uh, as a reminder to everybody watching, if you have questions, you can put them in the Q&A. We're going to go for a couple more minutes and then we'll, we'll bring Josh in and field some questions. Leah, how about you? Launching um, your aha moment and the best way that you found to acquire your customers. Yeah. Um, so I think my, the aha moment for, for me was, you know, when we launched Pepper, I thought we were launching a product that was very much needed. Mm. And when we launched on Kickstarter, what, what we, what I saw was not only like a lot of pre-orders and that we had met the goal, but our email was flooded, you know, with, with women kind of reaching out and saying, you know, you don't know how long I've been waiting for a brand like this. You don't know what I've struggled through in my adolescence years. You know, you, you don't know the names that I've been called for being small. Um, and so that was really eye opening because I think Jacqueline and I both realized like this could be much bigger. Um, the, the brand meaning you know like the, the community we can build um can go beyond just like you know delivering a product and so we started immediately after that a private facebook group um mm -hmm. that has been growing so fast and the engagement has been super organic like we don't even post anything on there and people are posting pictures of themselves you know in the in their product and, and talking about you know how how confident they feel and how like we've changed their lives and they're, you know, they're crying. And like, it's, it's like really, really amazing that, um, that a product can make such a big difference in someone's life. So I think that's what keeps us kind of like going and motivated is the fact that we are like, you know, making a difference in these customers' lives, which I just didn't believe. Like when I saw, when I would see like these, um, you know, brand, like founders talking about brands that way, it would never really like, clicked. Um, but when I experienced it firsthand, you know, that was really kind of like, um, it, it just changed, it changed things for me. Well, that's um, great for, for Rachel with the kids saying like, uh, I, I see your, your rockets of awesome products and they're so soft and stretchy. And for Leah, having your audience be your own unofficial brand ambassador, that's kind of the major win. So that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think like customer feedback is so important for you to kind of like shape, like we use that Kickstarter moment and the people and the things that, you know, our customers are saying to build our brand. Um, and it's so cool to, to know that like the kid, you know, kids were giving you feedback because, you know, kids don't lie. So obviously they're going to be like super upfront and they love it. You know, they're not just saying that. Um, so it's, that's, you know, that's super cool. Um, but yeah, I guess that, and then in terms of growth, um, I think it's changed uh, as the company has evolved. So I think the first year was press primarily and organic. So mm -hmm. it was, you know, articles and being published about us and us pitching and like that was driving a lot of traffic. And then we've switched to other um, like paid acquisition channels to expand further. And what has worked there for the paid? So it's really hard to acquire customers. It, yeah. You know, there's just a real frag, a lot of fragmentation out there, regardless of the industry. What has worked for you in terms of acquisition? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the bra market is so, there's so many competitors and I think a lot of them, you know, sound very similar to each other. Whereas with Pepper, you know, we're talking about a completely different kind of brand narrative. And so it really kind of stands out. And I think the people who click on our ads are intentionally, you know, in the size range, otherwise they wouldn't, you know, we're, we're very upfront about the size, the sizes that we offer and like who we are for. Um, and so we tend to have like a really high conversion because um, people are, it really resonates with them. And we're kind of like the only brand speaking about these issues in this way. Um, we've had a lot of ads that have blown up where we launch it and then it's women who aren't in our size range and they're commenting on it and saying like, you know, why do smaller women need bras? Like, this is ridiculous. And then smaller women will like jump in and they start like fighting with each other, which is like this, this happened during Kickstarter as well, which we were like, you know, really kind of like troubled by like, you know, why, why are they so mad? You know? And, and then those are kind of the ads that perform really well because the engagement is like off the charts and so it's our community jumping in and saying you know don't tell us what we need and then it's other people not you know so like 
that type of thing kind of creates a lot of engagement, organic engagement and increases the reach. Um, but again, we're really like, our brand is really, really focused. We didn't come to market with like a bazillion sizes or like we don't claim to be the brand for everyone. We had a really niche like focus. And so that allows us to be really targeted and then um, efficient with the marketing. Hey, Josh, why don't you come on? And while you're coming on, I'm going to ask Rachel one more question. And Rachel, for acquiring customers, which is a really nonstop battle in any e-commerce world, what has worked for you and any words of wisdom for those? And, and also marketing spend, right? That is, you want to kind of save those pennies and make the, you'd love to spend as little as possible. So how do you kind of balance that and, and looking at data and making decisions for how you spend your marketing? Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, a really good call out from what Leah said is that I think entrepreneurs often make one big mistake, which is that like, we are such big dreamers, right? And so mm -hmm. like, we're like, we want to do everything because we have like this amazing big vision. And I think if you look at the businesses that have had the greatest success, it's the ones that are like, so, so laser focused. And mm -hmm. they're like, we're going to do this one tiny little thing. We're going to do it really, really well. And then we're going to keep sort of like growing and expanding. Um, and so I think that's like a really important takeaway in this conversation. Um, but in terms of marketing, you know, I, what we've learned over the years, we've had uh, so much trial and error. We've hired a million agencies. I've called them marketing malpractice because we've um, horrifically overspent and ultimately found that like we just do better when we hire somebody internally and do it ourselves. Um, and that's not everybody, but for, for our brand, it is. Um, and ultimately, um, for a brand person, it kills my soul, but like for, we've found that like you just have to be so performance oriented that it really, ha it's like, the, the messaging and the imagery and it like, it has to be performance oriented and like you, it can be within your style guide, but like you got to let it go quite a bit because um, you have to find what works. And um, ultimately in our category, it's a very um, price sensitive category and, and it's really more sort of um, it's about, it's about discounting, um, no matter sort of the price point that you're in, like everyone is very promotional. And so the more you sort of speak to promotion, we always worry, like, would we get sort of a, this customer that when, wouldn't sort of like repeat and they wouldn't be a high quality customer. And we just keep testing and testing. So I think like, um, marketing is about sort of like trial and error and testing and not sort of throwing a lot of money at once and being very, very methodical and um, very like science driven about what you do. Okay, thank you. Hey, everybody, I'd like to introduce you to Josh Goldman. Uh, Josh has been fielding questions in the Q&A. Josh, you are a veteran venture capitalist, an angel investor. You've invested in a lot of e-commerce companies. Can you share a little insight and what you as an investor may be looking for? And if anybody's on the line who's about to start or thinking about looking for money, what they should be looking for or considering? Sure, yeah. Um, you know, I've been investing in e-commerce companies for 15 years. Um, a former entrepreneur myself in the space. Um, look, the trite answer for what we're looking for as investors is a passionate entrepreneur with a great product in a big market with few competitors. Mm -hmm. uh, realistically, uh, you almost never find that. For me, the, the must-have in that list is actually not what you may guess, kind of the big market or great product. It's the passionate entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And there can be kind of pseudo passionate entrepreneurs. And sometimes it takes some digging to find the ones that are really passionate. The ones who are gonna just never say die. They're gonna keep fighting and finding ways to succeed when things get really hard. And it takes that passion. As Rachel said and Leah said, it's, uh, it, it can be very difficult going. It, it is going to be difficult. So without that real passion for solving a particular problem, for me as an investor, it's a non-starter. Uh, I won't invest because people tend to give up if they're not truly passionate about the space that they're in. So I loved hearing Leah and Rachel's stories of why they're going into the markets they are because they have personal passion for those, those markets. Um, the other things that investors are looking for these days, um, you'll hear a lot of talk about recurring revenue models. Um, 
And look, that is attractive, but I don't want to give the impression that transactional e-commerce businesses are something of the past. They're not. I think, um, you know, Leah's running what sounds like a transactional business, and it's a great business. Um, but there was a real push several years ago for recurring revenue. So everyone created subscription boxes, even if their category didn't support it, um, to try to get recurring revenue. Recurring revenue can come from um, high frequency of repeat. And that's probably, you know, Leah is what Leah is doing. I think Rachel's business is truly recurring subscription. Uh, Leah's, it sounds like, is transactional, but I bet it has a very high repeat rate. So investors want to see one or the other to get to recurring revenue. <clears throat> um, the only way to get around that is if you have extremely high gross margins. And that's rare. I invested in a mattress company called Casper. People don't repeat and buy lots of mattresses. Um, there isn't a recurring model, but the margins on mattresses are so high that the lifetime value of a customer is really high even with one purchase. A product market fit is something that was uh, already discussed is key. Um, I really like to see a good go-to-market strategy in a pitch. Uh, how are you going to enter the market? How are you going to acquire the first customers? Is it through distribute? Are you getting distribution? Are you going direct to consumers? How do you get those first customers? So those are kind of the top, you know, kind of quickie tips I have as uh, as an investor in the space. Awesome. Um, do we have questions, Josh? Have you been fielding them? Oh, yes. Because I got I can I can pad with plenty of questions, <laughs> which I didn't even get to half my list. But it will take some field questions if we have some. Great. Yes, we're getting some questions, but there's uh, we're going to have time for a couple more. So okay. anyone who's listening, feel free to submit questions uh, while we're talking. Uh, first question is from Nikhil Abraham. Nikhil asks, for products selling for $100 or less that aren't SaaS, I think he's referring to non-recurring, how do you effectively market online when Google and Facebook cost is so high? Rachel, would you like to take that or Leah, either one? Yeah, I mean, you can absolutely do it. Um, you have to find, you have to find like the right creative um, and the right segments of customers on Facebook and Google to be targeting. Um, but then you have to find other really creative ways to market, right? So whether it's direct mail, um, mail is back, you heard it here. Um, old school snail mail. Um, also like ambassador networks, referral programs, um, influencer does work. Um, there's also like really interesting ways of doing direct mail through uh, retargeting. So somebody like, you know, through, you know, someone lands on your site and there, there are um, companies that can then actually like knowing exactly who that person is then send that that person something someone through the mail um also like sampling programs depending on how much your product is um but you really do have to understand you know what is what is your cac what is your lifetime value and that does take some time um and you have to be sort of like obsessive and scientific about it because you can spend a lot of money and and obviously that can also not go so well, but it is very possible. Leah, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I would say it, it's really kind of like depends on on the business, but you know, for us, like we we ran initial tests on Facebook and um, understood what our CAC was going to be, and it's still the same CAC as it is now. Um, so if our CAC, you know, if our customer acquisition costs wasn't profitable. Um, it would have made us kind of like question how we're going to scale the business. So I think every, every customer that you're targeting is different. And so it's important to do qualitative interviews, you know, customer discovery interviews with uh, potential customers to understand how they shop, where they shop, you know, is it through direct mail? Is it through Facebook? What makes an ad, you know, stand out? Like what, what are the things that you can test with your copy, with your imagery, you know, and, and I think it all comes down to testing. Uh, mm -hmm. But I would say that focus a lot on, you know, what your customer acquisition cost is on each channel. And for us, like, we, we personally, like, don't do things that are, that are, like, unprofitable. Some companies are willing to take on that unprofitable kind of, like, metrics at the beginning 
but they have a plan later to increase, you know, average order value or decrease their cost um, so they can have a bigger margin. But definitely do that analysis when you're launching your business and make sure that you have like a sustainable model um, that will work, like that your margin is going to work. Otherwise, you're launching a business that is, you know, you may have to like rely on venture capital fundraising for the rest of your, you know, and that's obviously not ideal. Like your goal should be to at some point hit profitability. Great. Great. We've got more questions coming in, which is great. Um, this one was submitted earlier. I don't have a name. Uh, it says, if I contract a supplier to produce a product for me, how do I handle product liability? I am the marketer, distributor, and seller, but I don't manufacture the product I'm selling. Either of you have any thoughts or experience with you know, contract manufacturing and kind of liability, warranty, uh, or liability questions? I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what they mean by product liability, but for instance, like we make children's clothes. We work with uh, factories that we do not own. Um, children's clothes have very, very specific regulations and testing standards. Um, so there are third party companies, for instance, that we use um, that will then take responsibility for a lot of the um, requirements that um, that they're certifying when we test through them. Um, so depending on the category, that, that might be an option. Yeah, I mean, for me, for, I mean, for me specifically, like I, I went to Colombia and I, and I partnered with a supplier there because I speak the language, I understand the culture. And for me, it was really important to build a trusting and like transparent relationship. Obviously not everyone has kind of like that situation, but it is the most kind of like important relationship that you, you will have if you have a physical product. Your relationship with your manufacturer and your relationship with your warehouse are kind of like super key. Um, and obviously a lot of it, like most of the time it's gonna be outsourced. Um, it's very rare that you have those things in house and are shipping things yourself um, when you're this early. So really take the time to partner with someone who not only has like good quality, but you have a good relationship with, and then, you know, speak to a legal firm to make sure you have a contract that like addresses the things you need, you know, who has experience in this, in this realm and can protect you contractually with the suppliers. But I have found that it is extremely hard to um, hold suppliers accountable, like legally when they're in a different, you know, country and when you're so small. So really make sure you're part, you're, you know, you're creating a partnership and you're not seeing them as just like a supplier. You're creating that partnership. You're selling what you, you're selling your dream to them and that they're, you know, willing to take the risk and like join you on, on your path versus someone who you feel like isn't fully there and the relationship might not work out because it's a huge risk to, you know, the growth of your business. Great. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Catherine Pinney. Uh, Catherine says, I just graduated this spring from Tufts. I really uh -huh. love what Rachel had to say about, about starting a small jewelry company on the side. I am starting a UX design position soon, but I've always had, a cre had creative side projects I'm passionate about. How has having an eye for design or a creative side helped in starting your business? Also, have you held on to the creative side while being heavily involved in the business side of your startups? Yeah, um, I think having a passion for design is just what I'm passionate about, right? And so in every company that I've built, it's, um, it's enabled me to help shape sort of the vision for the brand. And, and for me, it's uh, or for the business and it's always leaned or helped, you know, lean and sort of frame what the brand was going to be. Um, and certainly in building the business, it's defined, you know, where I was going to focus and where my strengths were going to be. And also, you know, very, um, very much opened up and, um, and helped me identify like where the holes were and where I was going to need to hire talent to be able to support where I was going to need um, other strengths within the business. Um, but I would say that, you know, what I've learned along the way, I think is as entrepreneurs, 
you know, in the beginning, and Leah, I'm, I'm curious if you've experienced this too, but I think in the beginning, you're so used to doing everything yourself and you're like, you're packing boxes and you're hiring people and you're the PR person and you're also pitching investors and you're literally, you do everything. And as you start to hire people, you start to sort of like peel off some of those responsibilities. And, um, and you get to a point where you realize like, oh, I, I don't need to be doing those things anymore, or maybe I shouldn't be doing those things anymore. And I think when you get to a point where you realize, you know, it's actually not beneficial to the business for me to be doing things that I'm actually not very good at, or I'm not efficient at doing anymore. And that's often hard to identify. Um, but those are the moments where you can really lean into, you know, at least for me, I can lean into my creativity because those are, that is one of my strengths. Josh, I'm going to ask a few more questions of Rachel and Leah, and you can chime in too. One of them being, okay, to start a business, in particular in e-commerce, do you need to go to, do you need to get an MBA? Who wants to take that? Well, I don't have an MBA. I always, I always thought I would get an MBA. Um, I think that I've seen both ways because my husband has an MBA and I, um, I was the wife of, of, the, of the husband getting the MBA. So I was like on campus and did all the stuff. And so I feel like I've kind of experienced it. Mm -hmm. And I think if you have that opportunity, it's like the greatest gift you can ever give to yourself. Um, and I see it as an opportunity for people who are trying to sort of like transition in their career or create an opportunity outside of what they were already doing. Um, but I also think for myself, um, Building your own business is like literally the most traumatic and greatest MBA you'll ever give to yourself also. So mm. <laughs> I don't think it's critical, but um, I think it's also incredibly, incredibly beneficial. Yeah, I think it's a, I mean, an extremely personal decision. It you know, depends on so many factors in terms of where your business, business is at as well. So I've heard from a lot of people that MBA gives you time, time to think about new ideas, time to you know, kind of like launch the business and get feedback from so many people, professors, you know, I'm not saying you need an MBA to make that time, but you know, that's one, one benefit of it for like, what I can say for myself is that when we launched Pepper um, on Kickstarter, uh, it took us from 2017, it took us a year to, to launch um, officially. We had to like refine the the product. You know, we had to get a the manufacturing took like longer than expected. There were like a lot of things that I didn't know about time and how long it took at the beginning. So for me, um, the MBA was a way to um, also kind of like for my own career. Like if Pepper didn't work out, I wanted to have other options. But I also went to the MBA with the full objective of growing Pepper. Um, so I wasn't going to all these trips with my friends. I was, I didn't have a social life for the first like year and a half. You know, I was fully kind of like devoted to the company and through the Stir network, you know, I've met a lot of investors. I refined how I thought about things. And for me, I was taking on a more operational role. So I needed to go back and learn about, you know, finance and like all these things that I just didn't get exposure to at Tufts. Um, because I was lucky that I had a co-founder who had complementary skills and she was, you know, doing the marketing and for her, the MBA wasn't, you know, as beneficial. Um, so there was a lot of kind of like personal factors that went into the decision and, you know, it worked out and, you know, it, I don't, I'm, I don't regret it, but it was extremely difficult to balance both a full-time MBA and a startup, but it was the decision that I made and I committed to it. Um, so, you know, I think, I'd be happy to talk to anyone who's considering an MBA and kind of like talk through the options and the options that I went through in my head. But I don't, I think it, you know, it, it really just depends on your situation. Josh, what about you? Yeah, I'm happy to jump in. Um, I did choose uh, an MBA to get an MBA. Um, I, I think Rachel's right that it's really not required. It's helpful um, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. And I think Leah made a great point that, it gives you time. Uh, you're, look, it's difficult, as she also said, to, to be a full-time MBA student and be creating a startup. But I created my first startup in the second half of my second year, uh, when frankly, you do have the time. Um, and it was amazing to have, you know, the faculty and guest speakers coming in who I could grab and get feedback and advice. 
Uh, one of my professors made the first contact for me that resulted in me getting funding while I was still in business school. So those things are, are helpful. Um, it's absolutely not required and creating a business is the best education um, as, as has been said. So um, if you can afford the time, um, you know, the question is what can you do with those two years? Um, you know, is an MBA education the best use of two, basically two years of, of your time? Uh, so no right answer, but I think it's, um, you know, both of the panelists made excellent points about advantages and disadvantages. Josh, while you were talking, we had another question from Jason. Jason's from New York, and he has a question for our panelists about affiliate programs and whether they would join, uh, whether they're on any, and do they think there's value for e-commerce business to be in a network like that, especially on business development or user acquisition, or would you oppose that idea? Thanks, Jason. Um, yeah, I think that you find that most D2C businesses that affiliate is part of the mix. I mean, in general, there's there's no single bullet, right? And so it's just a mix. And so affiliate is like, you know, a small percent typically of everybody's mix. Um, we haven't found that there is sort of, we haven't found like a massive unlock on affiliate, but we have ha heard some stories where people see a massive unlock for sort of a moment in time and then it sort of like fizzles and, it, and it's smaller again. Um, but I, I think it is always sort of like part of the mix. Leah, how about you? Yeah, I mean, we just started testing affiliates. Um, so for us, we've kind of like the, the channels that, that we've relied on um, so far the most are Google ads, um, Facebook, Instagram, that's primarily, and now we're expanding into, um, and testing. I mean, we're always testing, but like direct mail, um, you know, content promotion affiliates is, is one as well. Um, it hasn't been like a primary source of revenue, but we have heard that it has worked really well for other, um, D to C uh, companies. Um, so we're at the early stages of joining, but yeah, I would, I would, um, or just testing it, but I would say, um, every startup should kind of like test um, acquisition channels to see what works for them. Okay, awesome. Well, listen, you guys, we've come to the end of our hour. So I really want to thank everybody for joining today. And I want to thank Rachel and Lisa, Leah for your time and for your insight. Look for an email that will be sent out shortly uh, with the recording of today's event. And if you'd like to check out previous content from 10 or the other Tufts alumni groups, please check out the Tufts alumni YouTube channel. In terms of upcoming events, save the date for two. October 6th is Female Founders of Tomorrow. October 21st, First is media technology in the November election. And again, thank you all for joining. Um, it was a really good discussion and have a great week, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.